There was cold and snow. And like the fog that covered Fredericksburg, Virginia, there was great mystery as to what the last two months of 1862 would bring. On the 13th of December, that uncertainty was blown away by battle, and for one army, tactical victory. For the other, knee-buckling debacle and defeat. Afterwards, as winter wrapped the town and vicinity, and two armies within its icy fingers, there were lingering nightmares and a longing for home, despite the fact that the war was far from over. And so it would be, separated only by the Rappahannock River, the Union Army of the Potomac and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia faced one another, and in the often strange realities of war, common soldiers of both armies found opportunity to pine for peace. This is a tale with a plot that most strangely mixes hellish battle and compassion, and humanity that after more than a century and a half still moves one's heart and soul. This is the story of the Battle of Fredericksburg and the shared winter of 1862-63. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there, to show that history is indeed a story. Fredericksburg, Virginia was a little town with a long history. It was here that a young George Washington roamed, and there were others of national fame who once made this locale home, John Paul Jones and James Monroe. But during the American Civil War, its location made it some 51 miles north of Richmond and 52 miles south of Washington City a military target. On November the 7th, 1862, some 40 miles or so to the northwest, there was an event that, when played out, would put Fredericksburg squarely in the crosshairs of civil war. It occurred about 11.30 on a snowy evening and began when there was a knock on the tent pole of Major General George B. McClellan. The commanding general of the Army of the Potomac was in the process of writing his wife a letter but with the knock, stopped and invited two men inside. One was Brigadier General C. P. Buckingham from the War Department, the other Major General Ambrose E. Burnside. Both looked uncomfortable. Without ceremony, Buckingham delivered General Order No. 182. Reading it, Little Mac turned and said, well, Burnside, I turn the command over to you. It was an appointment he reluctantly accepted, for he knew all too well he had been selected because McClellan would not confront the enemy. Burnside would now be under great pressure to find the foe, and to do it soon. He considered his task a daunting one, one that left him sleepless and made him physically sick. Personally, he was friendly. He remembered names, but could be obstinate, unimaginative, and though he led a successful campaign in eastern North Carolina earlier in 1862, he would be the first to admit that he believed himself unsuited for command intellectually and emotionally. Indeed, the morning after he took the reins to the Army, he remarked to another officer, I do not feel equal to it. Regardless of his personal demons, on the 9th of November, he officially took command, and aware that Washington City wanted action, he submitted a plan. He would make a feint toward central Virginia, then move rapidly to take Fredericksburg. Once there, he would put his army astride the coveted Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad and drive on the Confederate capital, Richmond. That being done, Lee would have to pursue and Burnside could then offer battle on ground of his own choosing. 
To launch the campaign, Burnside listed his subsistence needs, and that included pontoons that would be required for his army to cross from the east to west bank of the Rappahannock River, which hugged Fredericksburg. He also reorganized. The so-called Left Grand Division was to be headed by cautious and uninspiring Major General William B. Franklin. Troublesome and conspiring Major General Joseph Hooker was tabbed to lead the Center Grand Division. And the Army's right Grand Division was given to a loyal 65-year-old Major General, Edwin V. Sumner, who possessed limited ability. Meanwhile, though his plan was not embraced by General-in-Chief Major General Henry Halleck and only lukewarmly received by the President, it was approved. Eager to move, his army lurched forward at 5 a.m. on Saturday, November the 15th, and did so unaware that his request for pontoons was already mired in red tape. Yet, his army moved quickly. Sumner's right Grand Division made 15 miles a day and on the 17th of November reached Falmouth, Virginia, which was just north of and opposite Fredericksburg. Incredibly, three days later, Burnside's entire army, 121,402 men and 312 guns were opposite the town itself. His army was there. The pontoons he requested were not. And that created an eternal what-if, for at that very moment, across the watery barrier, Fredericksburg was defended by only four Confederate companies, one cavalry regiment, and one battery of light artillery. Robert E. Lee's first corps under James Longstreet was 30 miles away, and Stonewall Jackson's second corps was in the Shenandoah Valley. Though there, Burnside's advance had been detected. Jeb Stewart and his cavalry had made Lee aware. But even if he knew Burnside was on the move, the Confederate chieftain was not certain of Burnside's true intent. Still, Lee put Jackson on alert to march at a moment's notice and ordered two divisions to march eastward. Lee himself and a Confederate division reached Fredericksburg about noon on the 20th. A second division arrived two days later. By the 23rd, three more divisions had arrived. Still, he had on hand about 40,000 men. At that moment, outnumbered still three to one. Burnside arrived in person a day before Lee, and despite the absence of the pontoons, two of his grand division commanders wanted to cross the unspanned river anyway. Both Sumner and Hooker wanted to get their men across the Rappahannock before the rest of Lee's army arrived, but fearing getting over and being isolated, to both, Burnside said no. He wanted to wait for the requested 36 pontoons, which when strung across and lashed together by rope would constitute a pontoon bridge. He figured some five or six were needed. Their absence perplexed him. Simply put, he would be the victim of assumption and misunderstanding. Despite his request, no one seemed to grasp the urgency of their delivery. Too many assumed someone else was responsible for getting the pontoons to where they were needed. When Burnside chose to wait for them, he lost the element of surprise, and most importantly, initiative. On the 22nd, still without pontoons, a frustrated Burnside wrote a carefully worded letter to General-in-Chief Halleck in Washington. I cannot make the promise of probable success with the faith that I did when I supposed that all parts of the plan would be carried out. The president said that the movement, in order to be successful, must be made quickly, and I thought the same. Finally, On Monday the 24th, the first pontoons arrived. The rest straggled in on the 27th, ten days behind Burnside's timetable. The delay? Fatal. For it allowed Lee time to gather recon, to analyze Burnside's true intent, and concentrate his Confederate army. 
Now certain of Burnside's target, Lee ordered Jackson's corps to race to Fredericksburg. While Burnside waited and his officers debated, Jackson's foot cavalry lived up to its reputation. They covered 170 miles in 12 days and arrived near Fredericksburg on Wednesday, December the 3rd. With his army of 78,511 men and 275 guns united, Lee now began to lay out his defensive line. As he did, the weather turned. On Friday the 5th, there was rain, then sleet, then several inches of snow. The next day, bitter cold. On the 7th, the temperature dipped into the lower 20s, and the next morning the thermometer read 16. Despite the cold and lack of overcoats and shoes, southern soldiers from the deep south reveled in the wintry weather. It is recorded that Georgians and Texans gathered and organized a huge snowball fight formed into regiments and brigades. They, in battle lines and with battle flags flying, stormed and pelted one another for hours. Perhaps, not surprisingly, Confederate medical staff reported that there were almost as many casualties as in battle. And while the military chessboard was being set, the common soldiers of each army took advantage of the fact that they were in such close proximity. On Wednesday, December the 10th, a Union band circulated through the federal encampment and played national airs. When no Confederate response came from the Western Bank, the band struck right into Dixie. Incredibly, only three days before battle, all along the Rappahannock, there was laughter. That changed early the next morning. Thursday the 11th, for Burnside ordered the laying of the pontoons to begin at 3 a.m. Two hours later, two Confederate signal guns alerted Lee's army that Union troops, the 15th and 50th New York engineers, had begun their work. To buy time, Lee ordered James Longstreet to send Brigadier General William Barksdale and his some 1,600 Mississippians and one battalion of Floridians to harass the effort. At first light, through eerie early morning fog, Barksdale's men opened up from the western bank. Forcing the engineers to take cover, Confederate fire exasperated an already frustrated Burnside to such a point that he ordered his heavy guns, 147 of them, to open up on the town. From 1 to 3 p.m., they fired at least 5,000 rounds into the largely evacuated town. The barrage was intense, and for the first time in the American Civil War, a town was caught in the vortex of combat. Fires broke out in town, and walls were breached or battered down. Ninety-eight shells reportedly hit a single residence on Caroline Street. Between 20 to 40 buildings were badly burned. Even houses of worship were not spared. Yet, after the bombardment, when the engineers returned, Barksdale's men rose from their cellars and the rubble and continued their disruptive and deadly fire. Nine times the engineers were forced back to the eastern bank for cover. Finally, at Wits Inn, a request was made for volunteers. Men from the 7th Michigan, the 19th and 20th Massachusetts rode across in empty pontoons and began to land on the West Bank. The 20th Massachusetts lost one-third of its 335 men in the crossing and landing alone. But once ashore, there was fighting that would be similar to that in France during World War II, street to street, house to house. For the 20th Massachusetts, one 50-yard stretch cost the regiment 97 officers and men. With the addition and weight of the 89th New York, Barksdale finally had to order his men back. Though they had suffered about 200 casualties, they had delayed the Federal crossing by some 12 hours. By 4 a.m. of the 12th, all the bridges were finally up. 
and Union troops poured across. At their mercy, a defenseless town. Pianos were dragged into streets and destroyed. Clothes were worn and torn. Portraits slashed, mirrors and windows broken. Though Union troops held the town, Lee was ready. His some 78,000 men stretched some seven miles, and both flanks were anchored. He had 11,000 Confederates per mile, six per yard. Burnside planned to first strike Lee's right. He wanted to seize a military road at a place known as Hamilton's Crossing, and by doing so, would breach Lee's line and roll it up. It was Jackson's part of the line, and that day he was dressed in a brand new uniform and kepi, a gift from Jeb Stewart. He was confident and welcomed attack, so much so that the day before he had been seen and heard whistling. Though Burnside knew what he wanted to do, he failed to communicate clearly. In the fog, Both weather-wise and mental, the Union commander issued his tactical orders at 5.55 a.m. that Saturday morning, the 13th, but they were not delivered until 7.45 a.m. In essence, he ordered 18,000 of the 60,000 men in the Union's left Grand Division to move on Jackson's 30,047 guns. Stage set there On the southern end of the battlefield at about 9.30, the fog that morning of the 13th finally lifted like a great curtain. Up on Telegraph Hill, where Lee made his headquarters, the scene below took Lee and his staff's breath. He turned and said, It is well that war is so terrible, otherwise we should grow too fond of it. Indeed, down below, with polished bayonets glistening in the sun, it was a martial spectacle. Forward marched the Pennsylvanians of Major General George Gordon Meade. With support from John Gibbon and others, the Union assault numbered some 8,000 as they advanced a bloody annoyance. On the extreme Confederate right, 18 guns under 24-year-old Major John Pelham raked the federal left flank. Pelham, who left West Point two weeks before graduation to join the Confederate cause, advanced two guns and around 10 a.m. opened up from only 400 yards away. Five Union batteries tried to silence him. They eventually did, when 24 guns blasted away his advanced position, yet in that rain of fire, despite three requests by Jeb Stewart to fall back, Pelham did so only when he ran low on ammunition. The fire created consternation for about an hour, but around 1 p.m., when the Union advance finally came on without hindrance, it found fortune. A portion of the Union assault struck Jackson's line where mistakenly there was a 600-yard gap. Into that yawning space, Federals poured. Behind, in reserve, South Carolinians under Maxie Gregg. Earlier, he had his men stack weapons to keep his men from firing into Confederate ranks. Incredibly, when men in blue approached, Gregg mistook them as friendlies and ordered his men to stand down. That order cost him his life. Jackson's line was breached. The Confederate military road was in Union hands, but then Burnside's poorly written orders and William Franklin's timidity damned Union success. Literally interpreting Burnside's order to use only 18,000 men of the 60,000 he had available, Franklin, despite three pleas for help by Meade, sent no reinforcements. Stonewall Jackson was not hesitant. He called up Major General Jubal Early's division, and it swept forward at about 1.30. Federal troops, flushed with success, now reeled backwards as a sea of butternut and gray surged forward and drove Union soldiers back down onto the plain below Fredericksburg. Meade was livid. 
He had lost one-third of his division and later asked his immediate superior, Major General John Reynolds, My God, General Reynolds, did they think my division could whip Lee's whole army? Federal artillery and infantry did stem Early's Confederate counterattack, and after doing so, lines were stabilized. By about 2.30 in the afternoon, both sets of forces were back where they started, and the battle on the southern end of the battlefield sputtered. A near disaster had been averted by Jackson, and Meade and Gibbon's success wasted. Yet incredibly, across the Rappahannock, reality escaped a searching eye. Using a spyglass from a second-story window of his headquarters, Burnside thought his plan was working. So to reinforce his believed success on Lee's right, he now gave orders to strike a few miles to the north, to hammer with force at the Confederate left. To attack, Union brigades would have to leave the protection of the town, march across a one-half mile of open plain, and toward a sunken road where Confederate infantry was protected by a stone wall and artillery that was positioned on Marie's Heights, which rose some 40 feet west of the eroded roadbed. Running diagonally across the first fourth of the open plain that Union soldiers would have to cross was a five-foot deep and 15-foot wide mill race. To cross, there were three small bridges. A few days earlier, Confederates took up the boards from one and left only the stringers. On the western bank of the mill race, a slight rise offered protection, then 500 more yards of open ground. About 100 yards from the Confederate sunken road, there was another slight elevation which offered an attacking soldier cover, but only if he went prostrate. Over that open plain, only a few outbuildings and houses offered cover. In essence, any Federal attack over this terrain meant charging over ground that was carpeted by 16 to 18 Confederate guns atop Marie's Heights and at the height of battle, some 4,500 infantrymen protected by a four-foot stone wall. Despite his guns and their placement, a concerned James Longstreet asked his artillery chief, Lieutenant Colonel E.P. Alexander, if his guns and their crews were up to the challenge. Alexander coldly replied, Sir, a chicken couldn't live on that field when we open up on it. Below the heights, Georgians, North and South Carolinians all hunkered down in what would be ranks four to six deep. It could be argued that this may well have been Lee's best defensive position of the war, and many federal officers that were there that day would agree. When Burnside asked opinion of his attack on this position, Colonel Rush C. Hawkins blurted, If you make the attack as contemplated, it will be the greatest slaughter of the war. There isn't infantry enough in our whole army to carry those heights if they are well defended. Surprised and irritated, Burnside turned to Lieutenant Colonel Joseph H. Taylor and asked his thoughts. Aware of the Confederate firepower that awaited them, he said, The carrying out of your plan will be murder, not warfare. Indeed, an assured James Longstreet told his commanding general that if you put every man in a blue uniform in front of my position and give me enough ammunition, I will kill every one. Around 10 a.m., the sun burned the fog away on this part of the battlefield, and again, like earlier to the south, it seemed like the raising of a great curtain on a great stage. Orders were conveyed, and about noon, the first of 18 piecemeal Federal Brigade attacks that day began. The first assault fell to men under Brigadier General William H. French. Incredibly, his men made it across the mill race, out in the middle of the open plain, and reformed under the protection of its western bank. Then they moved forward as one as if on parade. 
French's 1st Brigade under Brigadier General Nathan Kimball took the lead, and it withered under murderous Confederate fire and went to the ground, one-fourth of its number down and Kimball wounded. Next, about 150 yards behind, the brigade of Colonel John W. Andrews. They moved to fill the great bloody gaps created by Confederate fire. Andrews went down, wounded. His 10th New York lost nine of its 11 officers in less than an hour. Next, it was the brigade of Colonel Oliver H. Palmer. They, too, were forced to the ground. Yes, although some, incredibly, advanced to about 100 yards from the flaming stone wall, an entire division, three brigades, were shattered and broken. 1,160 casualties in about an hour. Reinforced during French's attack by two South Carolina regiments and two from North Carolina, the Confederates prepared for the next attack, and it came right about 1 p.m., It was the division under Major General Winfield Scott Hancock. First, he sent in a brigade commanded by Colonel Samuel Zook. It pushed to about 100 yards from the flaming wall. Some from the 53rd Pennsylvania actually got within 50 yards, but all two went to the ground. One-third of the brigade casualties. The 57th New York reduced to 50 men. Then advanced a unit of some renown, the Irish Brigade. With sprigs of boxwood in their kepis, some 1,200 men under the green flag of Erin advanced. They did so while fire from the stone wall was so intense it reminded one soldier of heat lightning. One regiment of Confederate tormentors was the 24th Georgia, comprised of Irishmen. Some aimed and fired through tears. A few of the Union Brigade got as close as 25 yards to the stone wall, but with 40% of the brigade casualties, Thomas Mars Irishmen also went to the ground. 545 of 1,200 of his Irish Brigade casualties. Now Hancock's 3rd Brigade was fed into the meat grinder. The former Vermont school teacher, Brigadier General John C. Caldwell, took his 2,000-man brigade in. One of his regiments, the 5th New Hampshire, was led by Colonel E. E. Cross. Already twice wounded in the war, he had had a premonition that this would be his last battle. Before going into action, he made his will, inventoried his property, packed everything he owned into a trunk, locked it, and gave the key to the regimental chaplain. Though horribly wounded this day, he would survive, but the division in which his brigade was organized, Hancock's, was wrecked. With 42% casualties, the division suffered the highest divisional loss in any one battle for the entire war. Despite the slaughter, there would be five more divisional attacks. Second Corps Commander Major General Darius Couch was in the cupola of the Fredericksburg Courthouse. From there, he watched in horror. At one point, after two of his divisions had been shattered, he turned to another and exclaimed, Oh, great God, see how our men, our poor fellows, are falling. The entire plain before him was covered with the wreckage of battle. Dead men and horses, blue-clad soldiers falling as they advanced, panicked men fleeing to the rear. To Couch, it was like watching snow fall upon warm ground. Still, the orders from east of the Rappahannock demanded more attacks, and so, in simultaneous fashion, the brigades of Brigadier Generals O. O. Howard and Samuel Sturgis went forward at about 2 p.m. Two new blue waves crested at the stone wall, which was aflame from one end to the other. The results? The same. Their attacks stalled. Couch's Second Corps had taken nearly 4,000 casualties. Thus far, 10 brigades had been shattered, and there would be more. Major General Joseph Hooker was ordered to send forward elements from his 5th Corps. 
Hooker, aware that Burnside's plan was in shambles, raced to convince the commanding general to end the human holocaust. While he unsuccessfully tried to do so, Brigadier General Charles Griffin's division advanced. It was now between 3 and 3.30 in the afternoon, and its brigades, too, were cut down. Brigades led by Colonels James Barnes, Samuel Carroll, Jacob Schweitzer, and Thomas B. W. Stockton. In Schweitzer's brigade, the 32nd Massachusetts lost one of every 10 men in 10 minutes. It was now about 5 p.m. Sunlight was fading. Common soldiers hugging the ground before the stone wall, using their own dead for shields. All prayed for nightfall. And yet, thanks to a wildly erroneous report from one of Hancock's brigades that shifting Confederates were actually retreating, an order went to Brigadier General Andrew Humphreys to take his 4,500 in. As these Pennsylvanians moved forward, survivors from earlier attacks raised themselves to grab at belts, at pants, anything to try and pull men to the ground to save them from certain death. After Humphrey's repulse, two more brigades went in, both unsuccessful, and incredibly, in the fading light of day, one more attack. Rush Hawkins' brigade from the Ninth Corps. It came well after 5 p.m., men advancing in the long shadows, an eerie backdrop of twilight. Aimed at the Confederate right of the stone wall position, broken terrain, darkness, and southern fire drove it, too, to the ground. Seven divisional attacks, 18 brigades. In six hours of combat before the stone wall, not one man had even touched it. Back across the Rappahannock, Ambrose Burnside was not aware of the disaster. His army had suffered 12,653 casualties, some seven to 9,000 of them in front of the wall at the foot of Marie's Heights. Where McClellan never knew when to start, it seemed Burnside did not know when to stop. During the evening, he incredibly planned to renew attacks at first light the next day. He announced that he personally would lead his old Ninth Corps into battle. His staff and lieutenants talked him out of it. The night of the 13th, for those survivors pinned down on the plain in front of the stone wall, well, it was something from a nightmare. The temperature dropped. Wounded let slip pitiful cries for home and mother. Some froze to death. One of those trapped that night, the 20th Maine's Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He spent the night between two dead men. A third served as his pillow. He used the flap of a dead man's overcoat to keep him from freezing. All night long, the other worldly and unearthly sounds of the wounded and dying. And there was something else that night that was unearthly. Soldiers of both armies witnessed a rare display of the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. To Confederates, it was God Almighty's celebration for yet another Southern victory. To Union soldiers, a horrible omen. The next day, the 14th, the plain before the stone wall was still a no-man's land. And that was the stage for one of the war's most memorable scenes. As reported by enough eyewitness accounts to give the story respectability, the sights and sounds of human distress on the other side of that stone wall moved one Confederate to ask permission for a daring act. It was Sergeant Richard Kirkland, Company G, 2nd South Carolina. Confronted by waves of pitiful cries from wounded Union soldiers, he, all of 19 years of age, felt compelled to do something, as he put it, <laughs> 
to help those poor people crying for water. Given reluctant permission, he exchanged his rifle musket for filled canteens and without a white flag of truce, risked his life to stand and become a target. He made his way over the stone wall, moved to the Union wounded closest to him, lifted heads, and gave water to those who had been exposed for hours. When Union soldiers recognized his act of humanity, they held their fire. So, too, did Confederates, while his mission of mercy continued. In the hell of battle, he, this angel of Marie's heights, was an oasis of compassion. And yet, despite his heroic act, the beast that is war refused to acknowledge or remember, for already manufactured even that day, a federal bullet which would find him September the 20th, 1863, at a place called Chickamauga. Hit in the chest, he gasped to comrades, I am done for. You can do me no good. Save yourselves and tell Pa I died right. Robbed of his destiny by civil war, Richard Rowland Kirkland, dead at 20. And though it took time and reflection, today he is remembered. At the foot of Marie's Heights, there is a memorial to him. Erected in 1965 on the battlefield, a plaque reads, A hero of benevolence, at the risk of his own life, he gave his enemy drink at Fredericksburg. In victory, Lee's losses numbered a relatively light 4,201. Yet that victory was bittersweet, for it had been a tactical one. Unable to follow it up, it was not strategic. Yet another drive on Richmond had been stopped, and stopped with great union loss to men and morale. During the night of the 15th, a dispirited Union Army of the Potomac slipped quietly back across the Rappahannock, and the precious pontoons, whose late arrival condemned so many men, were cut from their moorings. When news of the defeat reached Washington City and the horrendous casualties reported to Abraham Lincoln, a mortified 16th president lamented, If there is a worse place than hell then I am surely in it. Back down in Virginia, in the days after the battle, the two armies settled into winter quarters, separated only by the icy blue finger of the Rappahannock. Though desperate for supplies, morale soared in the Confederate camps. Another snowstorm allowed the men in Butternut and Gray to find amusement. On the 29th of January... A 9,000-man snowball fight. Across the way, the mood was quite different, for Union morale for that army was the lowest of the war. And yet, incredibly, the close proximity of the two opposing armies presented opportunities for enemies to become friends. By means of handmade boats and with wire in trolleys, common soldiers from both armies traded coffee for tobacco and vice versa. They swam, they shared campfires, and they shared also the powerful salve of music. The story goes that in an effort to raise morale, a Union band late on a winter's day in January decided to move through the Union encampment. They played tunes like Father Abraham, We Are Coming, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, Hail Columbia. As the concert continued, a glance across the river revealed Confederates who stood where they were or set on the bank to enjoy the music as well. In my mind's eye, I can see it. I can hear it. The band played on even as the sun began to set, and as they are wont to be, the winter sunset splashed 
the western horizon with a palette of colors that would challenge any artist, with deep reds and oranges and fuchsias. And about that time, the story continues. The one Confederate rose and shouted across the water, All right, play some iron. And with that request, the Union musicians broke right into Dixie and the bonnie blue flag and the yellow rose of Texas. And within minutes, thousands of soldiers drifted toward the river and lining both banks lifted their voices in unison to the heavens. And then again, in my mind's eye, as the reds and oranges of that winter sunset started to fade to the lavenders and violets, the federal band decided to play one last song, Home Sweet Home. When they did, grown men with swimming eyes tried to choke down the tears and sing the words. As popular historian Bruce Catton noted, there wasn't a dry eye on the Rappahannock. For that, I would give anything to have been there. As the last notes of that song drifted across the landscape, with sun gone and in the darkness of a winter's night, common soldiers from both armies drifted back to their camps where they longed for home and loved ones. Yet the cruel reality, they were caught up in a conflict that seemed to have no end. In terms of casualties, Fredericksburg was the most lopsided major battle of the entire war. By the 1st of February, 1863, there would be yet another federal commander, and by the end of April, another campaign to take Richmond. And yes, there would be more killing two and a half more years of it. Yet the common soldiers, the men who would have to do the fighting and dying during the winter of 1862-63, remembered when, in the aftermath of Fredericksburg, they looked across the river and were reminded that, though in different color of uniform, they all worshiped the same God, they spoke the same language, and they were all Americans. All that made even more poignant when one Union soldier admitted, when we weren't killing each other, we was the best of friends. That Union soldier spoke for hundreds of thousands of common soldiers who over centuries and regardless of nationality have found themselves in a conflict not of their choosing. For me, it brings to mind a short poem. 40,000 men went forth to fight when 40 statesmen thought it right. Had statesmen fought and died instead, there would have been but 40 dead. The next time we gather, we'll head for the southeastern coast of North Carolina and relate the story of the fort that protected Wilmington and the ambitious, amphibious operation to capture it. At stake, the last Confederate port open to the outside world. I hope you'll join me for Fort Fisher, Confederate Goliath. number that needs perspective. Union casualties during that 12-hour period alone were double the number of American casualties at D-Day 82 years later. Total casualties? Four times more. Even more sobering, the 23,000 casualties were more than the American Revolution, War of 1812, and the Mexican War combined in 12 hours. In 12 hours at Antietam, 1,916 casualties every hour, 32 every minute, one every two seconds. And yet, after such bloodletting, the battle was 
a tactical draw. Yet George McClellan thought it had been a decisive victory and informed Washington as such. It might have been had he been bold on several occasions, if he had moved aggressively after finding the lost order, if he had attacked one day earlier at Antietam, if he had better coordinated his attacks the day of the fight, if instead of holding thousands of troops in reserve, he had committed one more corps when Lee's center was breached or when Burnside's troops were driving toward Sharpsburg. If he had renewed the fighting on the 18th, when Lee had essentially 28,000 infantrymen and McClellan had 30,000 in the positions won the day before and over 26,000 fresh troops. If he had used his personal magnetism to instill a killer instinct in his men. Simply put, George McClellan was so fearful of losing he refused to risk winning. Yes, a tactical draw. But Lee's retreat provided the impetus for Union strategic victory. And it came not on the battlefield, but in Washington City. And not by the firing of thousands of muskets. By simply by the stroke of one pen. On September the 22nd, five days after the battle, Abraham Lincoln... On the impetus of McClellan's confident words that reached him, issued the Emancipation Proclamation. It was a mailed fist in a velvet glove. If by January the 1st, 1863, the 11 states that seceded did not return to the Union, there would be no peace with compromise. If they remained outside the Union by the first day of 1863, the powers of the United States government would be broadened. If they did not return, a war for Southern independence would push the United States government to create a revolution against Southern institutions. And Europe would now have to consider a whole new set of parameters. Recognize the South and therefore recognize slavery. The results of that great and terrible day in Western Maryland pushed the mighty envelope of emancipation. And with that, the country was forever changed. The battlefield today is one of the most pastoral, one of the most beautiful I have ever visited. It's a place that seems more suited for landscape artists rather than a stage for human disaster. That great and terrible day was tactically inconclusive, but great and decisive consequences leapt from those 12 hours of concentrated violence. The Confederate summer offensive was unhinged. It gave Lincoln the opening he needed to change the character of the war. And that act, the Emancipation Proclamation, meant that George McClellan's sun began to set. Simply put, there was no room anymore for a military officer who believed in a limited war with limited objectives. And what of the thousands that fought there? Common soldiers who had no idea that where they fought that day would have had such great consequence. But yet, from what they did that day, a national lesson learned. It would take years to fully understand and implement what emancipation truly means. In fact, we're still trying to do just that. But it seems that sadly, great social change can only come about after wallowing in crisis and bloody turmoil. Perhaps it is human nature to be knocked to our knees before we as a people, as a nation, finally do what we know, deep down, is the right thing to do. On our site, you'll find maps of the battle, early morning phase, late morning phase, afternoon phase, and two suggested works that breathe life to the events of that that occurred on a Wednesday in September 1862.
I hope you will join us next time when we turn to the conflict on the water. We'll spin the story of the 376-ton monster that in 1864 turned federal plans in North Carolina, Virginia, and the entire Eastern Theater on its head. When we next gather, the extraordinary career and unbelievably daring destruction of the Confederate ironclad, the CSS Albemarle. Until then, this is Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening.